All right, I'd like to talk a little bit about options for uh, coordination, synchronization, and locking in uh, ISIS process groups. Uh, this will be a little bit shorter than the other modules, and I'm sure people who have been watching them will be relieved to hear that. Uh, so ISIS has quite a few options uh, for doing uh, distributed coordination, and uh, each one of them is built over the same primitives we've been hearing about in the other modules. So in some sense, uh, these uh, ideas really involve taking multicast together with the information you have from the process group view and then leveraging that to, to do what you'd like to do. Um, there are all sorts of patterns that are possible and I'm really hoping that from this module you'll understand some of the choices and the way that you put them together can then be varied depending on, on your goals. So uh, let, me, let me give some examples of things you might be trying to accomplish and then we'll talk about how to do it. One famous way of doing fault tolerance is called uh, primary backup fault tolerance. And in this, in this approach, you've got some kind of a group maybe that just has two members in it. Uh, and uh, the group receives a request and you decide that A and B are going to handle it. Uh, a will do all the work, but if A crashes at some point, B will take over. And very often when you have a primary backup model, um, what you're really doing is you're talking to an external client and saying, uh, if you have a question about the air traffic control system, ask me. And so A might be the contact point. And uh, if A fails, B would take over. A harder problem, which is really not solvable, technically speaking, with primary backup, is if a request comes in and A is supposed to process it and then respond, and B will take over and process it if A doesn't. And what makes this hard is that uh, if A crashes after performing the work but before responding, B might wake up and not know if the work was done or not. So that's a kind of an inherent problem. And one thing to be aware of in a primary backup scheme is that very often when B wakes up, it needs to check some property the, of the environment to see if A did whatever A was supposed to do. Keep that in mind later as we talk about primary backup. A generalization of that that you can support in group communication systems is called coordinator and cohort, just mostly to distinguish the terminology. Um, and in this, you have an entire group, and the idea is that different requests load balance across the group. So each request that comes in has its primary and has its one or two backups. Um, and uh, it spreads the work around so that a primary for one request might be backing up other requests. It's a very popular scheme, at least in the past, because uh, you've got a group and instead of having the backup sitting idle, the backup is working just as hard as the primary, but simply on other requests. And then what you have to do is make sure that any updates to the group state reach all of the members. And these updates could include messages that say, I finished doing such and such an action. Uh, another kind of a coordination that's interesting to think about involves periodic actions with a timer. So suppose that we're managing the smart electric power grid. It may be that uh, every 30 seconds we should pull some device, or every 20 minutes we should reconfigure the settings on certain types of, 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 of breakers. So that would be a situation where a timer goes off in a system like ISIS, what you would very often do is say that I'm going to select the leader of the group, which we generally use as a synonym for the rank zero member in the current view. We can say the leader of the view sets a little timer thread to go off at that frequency. It could create a thread and have it sleep for that period of time, or it could use a, a callback mechanism. ISIS has one built into it where you get an up call event at some frequency. And then when the timer goes off, you could send a multicast to the group saying, now is the time to perform such and such an action. And if you took that approach, you could actually have a kind of a distributed action where the leader triggers it, but each different group member might be responsible for some different part of performing the work. And we can easily do that. Locking is another kind of synchronization that you can support in ISIS process groups. And in fact, ISIS has a tool for this. I'll show you quickly how to use it a little bit later. Um, and in here, what we have is typically that the group is managing some kind of data. But keep in mind that the data might be external to the group. The group could be managing uh, jobs for a line printer queue, or it could be managing a database or some other kind of resource. And then the, the role of the group is to enforce some form of synchronization. For example, 
only one process is using the line printer at a time, things of that type. Uh, ISIS has two types of locking that you can use internal to groups. One form is just mutually exclusive, lock and unlock, and one holder of a given lock at a time. The locks have names to let you support multiple locks at the same time, but for any given lock, it's either locked or unlocked. And then there's a slightly um, fancier version where you have read locks, uh, where you can have multiple readers, and write locks, and you can only have one uh, holder of a write lock at a time. Uh, and finally, uh, barrier synchronization comes up in certain types of systems. And this occurs where you ask a set of processes to do something, but they may take different amounts of time to do it. And a barrier synchronization occurs when the leader who initiated it says, okay, now I'm going to wait till everyone's finished, and all of those threads execute, and when they complete, they reach the barrier. And when the leader sees that everyone has reached the barrier, then they can move onward. You can imagine how that fits nicely with the notion of an ISIS query, send out a request, do some work, and then send back replies. Of course, the normal ISIS query has a timer running, and it times out automatically after a certain amount of waiting. You'd better use a larger timeout value. The other reason that an ISIS query doesn't perfectly match that is that uh, while performing the the work in an ISIS query, it's not a good idea to do things that block for very long periods of time. Uh, you more often would have to spin off a thread, and so you have to do this a little carefully because otherwise ISIS will see that a reply was required from each of these receivers, and it'll send back a null reply because it'll think that they didn't intend to send a reply. So there's a little bit of, of magic you have to do if you plan to use that pattern, but it's doable. So here's a summary of your options. And I'll just run through them again quickly. You've got primary backup, coordinator cohort, periodic actions, locking in the mutex form, read-write locking, and barrier synchronization. And what I've done in this table is just to summarize the purpose of each one, as we just talked about. And here on the right, I've introduced a little bit of detail about the techniques. We're going to say a bit more about that in the remaining slides. And um, uh, fundamentally, these techniques come down to using multicast, although in the case of the locking tool, we've built the multicast layer into uh, an API that just talks about locks. But in fact, if you read in the ISIS manual about that section, you'll you actually see exactly how it was built. It was built as a simple kind of a state machine that's fully replicated across the members of the group, and each new lock request enqueues itself on a list of pending requests for each given lock, and then uh, as the lock becomes free, you look at the list and you allocate the lock to whoever's next in line. And that's, that's all it does. You, you could build this yourself, except that we, we did it for you. So let's talk about primary backup replication first. The easiest way to do this is to form a group with two members. And then the rule would be to say that the rank zero member, the leader, is the primary. And the rank one member is the backup watching the state of the primary. When the group manages some kind of updated, uh, some sort of state, such as what we're working on or a request, then what you would have to do is make sure that any kind of a request reaching the leader gets replicated across the members before the leader starts to perform actions on it, so that that way the backup or backups, if you have more than two members, are in the same state. Then when the leader has finished, it says, I'm done doing that task, and the backup knows and can mark that the task has been completed. And if the leader crashes, the backup knows what it was currently doing at the time it failed. The new view event that comes through tells you that. So the main issue with primary backup is that uh, the small window occurs during which you might imagine that the leader has finished performing some kind of action but then it crashes, and we don't really know if the backup is in the same state as the leader at that point. The lead backup might not know that the action was taken. Typically, when the action is finished, you'll send a message to your backup. But uh, that message may be exactly the point, the sending of that message may be exactly the point where the crash occurred. And a second issue you can have is that you might not know if the leader replied to the external client. So you would hope that ISIS would have some magic wand solution to that, but as I alluded to earlier, the reality of the situation is it can't be done. Um, the, you can never do better than to resend that reply, check to see if the work was done. And if you can't check, Leslie Lamport, the famous uh, researcher in this area that I mentioned, he talks about the launching of a rocket. Well, if you can't check to see if the rocket has been launched or not, 
you may really not be able to use modern computing techniques to solve your problem. So generally, we're working in a world where redoing an operation might not be a dangerous mistake, or if it would be, where you can check to see if the operation was done. Um, one use case that I talked to some people about not that long ago involved using a system to control somebody's insulin pump. But it turned out you could check the insulin pump and see what it had done recently. Well, when a backup takes over from a leader, checking the state of the insulin pump is an example of something you just might have to do. Now, ISIS doesn't know whether that leader managed to send the insulin pump its latest command or not right before it crashed. Something that can be quite useful in this connection is that ISIS does integrate nicely with a technology that was developed by my colleague Robert Van Renesse and one of his students, uh, a fellow named Robert Certain, called TCPR. Uh, and I'll tell you quickly how this works, but you'll have to look it up if you're interested in using it. So TCP and UDP are obviously the ways clients would normally connect to a service, most often with TCP these days. And the trouble with TCP is that if you're connected to your primary and then the primary crashes, the TCP line breaks. Now the backup wakes up and the client and the backup have to resynchronize. Well, TCPR sometimes can let you mask this so that the client never sees it at all. So what you do with TCPR is you make a connection and it runs through a little kind of a firewall component and that's where TCPR lives to route the traffic through TCPR. The client doesn't know that it's talking to TCPR instead of talking to the group. And you can even set up TCPR to migrate from node to node. Now behind TCPR is your application, which actually still receives its data on TCP. There's a TCP connection that sort of flows through TCPR. And what happens now is that as the primary takes actions, before it takes any action, it logs what it read off the TCP connection at the backup. And before it sends any kind of a reply, it logs what it will send at the backup. Now, if the primary crashes and the backup takes over, the backup knows what the primary was about to do. It was about to process this request. It was about to send this message. TCPR allows the backup to reconnect itself to the existing open TCP connection totally transparently, and when it does that, it can find out how many bytes have been read and how many bytes have been written on that connection. And if the client, the, if the client is talking to, to TCPR, absolutely no data would ever be lost or duplicated. Right? So this connection comes in, and now the backup has taken it over, and because the backup has the checkpoint of what the primary is going to do, and it can see how many bytes, for example, were written, it can say, oh, he was writing 1,000 bytes, but only 200 of them got written, it can write the other 800 bytes. So with TCPR, you can actually completely hide the rollover from primary to backup if you combine TCPR with an ISIS group. That would be an example of something that's not hard to do today, you have to download those two pieces of technology, my stuff and TCPR, and glue them together in a straightforward way. And we have done that completely successful and totally masked these failovers. Coordinated cohorts, similar kind of thing. What you do here is the original request gets multicasted across the group by whoever receives it. So they have to kind of relay it. Message comes in, they turn around and multicast it. You maintain a queue using ordered send of activities and you assign each request to a primary and you assign some one or two others as sort of backups, as cohorts. And then at the point where the primary is ready to reply to its external user, it's finished the work, first it sends a multicast and you cross it off this queue. You say, okay, that one's done. And if the primary fails without doing that, whoever the next cohort is sees the new view, becomes the new highest ranked primary and takes over as the new coordinator, new leader for that activity. And now its job is to do the work and then terminate it at the end. Again, ISIS doesn't give you a tool to do that, but with ordered send, it's really very easy to do. The events in your state machine are the ordered sends of the original request and the completion messages. And the other event is the new view events. And because everyone sees these in the same order, you're guaranteed that everybody can stay in the same state, can stay in sync, and it's a pretty easy code to write.
Uh, which multicast do you use? Just to summarize, you use order 10. You could probably get away with weaker protocols, but you'd have to be very careful how you send them. But ordered send plus a flush is ideally matched to this. And the nice thing about the g.flush mechanism as we talked about is you won't talk to your external user until you're quite sure that that prior ordered send has reached its destinations. And yet, you're using quite a fast protocol. Ordered send, as we talked about in the other module, is a very fast protocol. Periodic actions with a timer. This is a trivial case. You just have a thread that you're launching your leader, waits 10 seconds or whatever the number is, sends a multicast to everybody and says, take the step for time 10 o'clock. Everyone receives that message. It can have data in it telling each separate member what to do or describing some other kind of an agenda for the next hour. The different members look up their role. They can look at the process group view, check their rank, see if there's work for the rank three member to do at 10 o'clock. If so, the member does it. If not, and this will occur within a few milliseconds. Your members will be extremely tightly synchronized, particularly if you use the faster primitives like send or ordered send. So these low latencies, a few milliseconds, allow you to create a group which in near real time, near instantaneous time, performs multiple actions at multiple locations. Quite powerful if you're doing some form of process control, for example, a chemical plant, telecommunication systems. And you can do things that are even fancier. It turns out that uh, you can build certain kinds of mission critical systems in which you, you actually don't trigger an action by a message, but you pre-plan that the action should occur when a certain time is reached, and you can get even tighter resolutions. I don't want to, <coughs> sorry, I don't want to get very detailed about that, um, but you can read about this in uh, journal articles that have been written about real-time systems that take timed actions, and you'll see that in general you can coordinate actions down to the uncertainty and latency associated with your underlying communication infrastructure. And since these days that's often in the hundreds of microseconds, it's actually possible to coordinate turning a device on at multiple spots or switching from green to yellow to red to yellow to green again to within resolutions that could be fractions of a millisecond. Read and write locking, as I said, is a possibility with ISIS. And the way this works is that ISIS supports locks. And the locks exist across an entire group. But you can create a group just for the purpose of locking on behalf of some other system that might have just a few members. And the basic API allows you to request a lock, which is just an absolute mutex lock. Or you can differentiate and say, I want a read lock or a write lock. Each lock has a name, which is a string. And you can give some arguments that specify a timeout for how long you're willing to wait before this lock is acquired. And if the timeout expires, your request will get canceled. Um, and then you can control various parameters. Um, now, the basic locking is just as it sounds, it's very simple. The main thing that comes up in ISIS is the question of what should happen to the lock if the lock holder crashes? Should it be released or should it be retained? And if it's retained, how do we implement that? And so lo the locking package in ISIS, what it does is when a new view is defined, if a lock holder is one of the failed processes, it looks to see what policy you requested in terms of lock persistence. If you asked us to, we'll pass that lock to the new group leader, the rank zero member, and if you asked us otherwise, uh, or if you use the default, the lock breaks, meaning it's released and someone else can obtain it. You would use the retention rule if the person holding the lock, the node holding the lock, might have been in the middle of doing something and has to be cleaned up first. And you would use the break lock rules if it was just a form of synchronization and if that process failed, then it doesn't need to be, uh, the lock doesn't need to be retained anymore. Okay, And as I mentioned, you can also specify a timeout on how long your application will wait. And the way we do that is if the timeout expires, we send a cancellation message. And your application either gets the lock or it gets an exception saying that the lock request itself canceled. Um, and this just summarizes the handling of failures. And as I mentioned, you have a choice. The default is that locks will break. But if you override that default, which is very easily done by specifying the lock release policy, then uh, write locks can be 
automatically passed to the rank zero member. Read locks will always break because our view is that uh, almost by definition, a read lock in a group means that you weren't going to change any state. And so in the way that ISIS does it, read locks always break. If you wanted to do a type of reading where you're concerned that you need to retain that lock in the event of a failure, then just use the basic locking layer, which really treats all locks as being mutually exclusive and doesn't distinguish read from write. And the persistent state of the lock manager is something that you can actually control. So normally the lock manager runs in memory, but if you'd like the locking state to survive, even if the entire system shuts down and then restarts later, you can actually ask us to make the lock state persistent. And that's easily done. And if you do that, uh, the lock state is stored into a checkpoint file using the, the group persistence features. And when the system restarts, the lock group reloads that state and it's right back where it was. Uh, and why would that be important? Well, one example would be if you're locking a database replica to do a bunch of operations on it, after a crash, it might be important to you that even if the whole process group crashed, that after you start to restart, that you get a chance to clean that temporarily messed up database up before anybody tries to use it again. So that would be an example where even after a crash, you might want the lock to still be held so that you can finish doing the cleanup. And you have features to do that. If you take a quick look at the ISIS manual, you'll see the details. But none of the things I'm talking about involve more than one line of code, basically, to enable them. Then there's your logic to make use of them. What about barrier synchronization? This is most typically achieved using query. People take actions, and then they reply. But do be careful about timeouts. And the thing to be cautious about is what we talked about in the basics of ISIS, that, that your application is basically operating on threads. And when ISIS up calls into you, it needs those threads to come back down into ISIS fairly quickly. So in this case, you're going to have an up call, and then you're going to compute for a while. My recommendation is spin off a separate thread for each of those computations. But then how do you prevent ISIS from sending a null reply because here was a query, and the thread that handled it didn't reply. Well, in ISIS, there's a call you can do that says, I will send the reply to this query on this other thread. So you do that call. ISIS understands that you've spawned off threads. Now the query will wait as long as the timeout says it should wait, which could be very long if you set the timeout to a long value. Your threads run. They each send back a reply, and that satisfies the barrier synchronization goal. So we also recommend that in this kind of case, you send back the information about the, the view of the group that you were in at the time you were taking the action. And that way, the initiator can tell if every part of the action was taken. So these replies come back. You'd like to know that I only got six out of eight replies, because it would tell you that two out of the eight pieces of work never got finished. So here's a summary of our options. Primary backup through barrier synchronization. And uh, as we saw, how these things are used and why they're used. Um, all of them are quite easily done within the ISIS system. Uh, and in fact, these are very, very common techniques to use by the skilled ISIS programmer. And what's interesting is you can use these ISIS features to control things outside of the system outside of the group, but in your cloud computing infrastructure, or perhaps in your building, or in the physical world. Um, the one caveat being that, in general, when a failover occurs, you need some way to figure out how much of what that primary process was doing got finished before the, the backup took over. So that ends this module.